good noontide. Howard Wig, Think Tech Hawaii, code green on a beautiful sunny July 18th, 2022 in Honolulu. Some of you probably thought about dabbling in politics, but who in the world ever thought of running for governor? Just a very, very, very select handful of you. And had you done that, you might have launched yourself on a glorious adventure, learning new things every step on the way. And to tell us about such an adventure is Tom Brandt, a friend of many years ago. He used to be with the uh, Department of Business Economic Development as an economic analyst. And he is now a foresight and Policy analyst sounds very, very distinguished. Tom Brandt, welcome to the program. Long time no see. Look even more distinguished than ever. And launch us, please, on this, this glorious adventure of almost <laughs> becoming a gubernatorial candidate within a hair's breadth you were. So take it away, Tom. So we, good to we see snatched, you. We snatched defeat from the jaws of victory. Mm -hmm. uh, well, briefly, Howard, um, as you know, some of this, uh, I've been in Hawaii 43 years. I first came out to work in travel and industry management after being a journalism major on the mainland and working in that field, both print and broadcast. But Got a chance to come out to Hawaii and work and travel, and that sounded like fun. I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I grew up yet. And then I went back to UH in 1984, uh, initially to get a master's degree, thinking I might want to be some sort of uh, consulting foresight analyst. Uh, they had a program up there that offers master's and doctorate in something called Futures Studies, uh, which was a program started by a gentleman named Jim Dater. Which, I remember him well, yes. Jim's still alive and well, and uh, uh, you'd think he's 40 years younger. But long story short, during my master's program, which I did full time, it's, that's when I kind of had an, the light bulb moment. Like, what am I going to do when I grow up? And I was like 30, 31 years old when this happened, so I was a late bloomer. But um, it occurred to me as my interests seemed to crystallize. And I said, nobody's going to pay me to think about this stuff unless I'm a college professor, right? That's the only place you can pay, get paid to set your own agenda in terms of research and writing and so forth. Um, so I finished my master's, but being in my early 30s, I wasn't wild about the idea of being a full-time uh, doctoral student, doctoral candidate, and building a mountain of student loan debt. So I literally had a job with the State Department of business, economic, and development, and tourism fall into my lap, literally. Uh, Howard, you were there before I was, and you're still there after I was. But uh, my advisor, Jim Dater, again, I walked by his office some, one time uh, when I was finishing my master's in 86. He said, you still looking for a job? And I said, yeah, what do you got? He goes, well, there's this guy at DBED, <clears throat> Craig McDonald. He was then the uh, uh, branch chief for ocean resources. So I started there as an emergency hire for one year, uh, last year, the Ariyoshi administration. So I've worked for like half of Hawaii's governors technically over my 20 years. But um, uh, then I segued from ocean resources, which was just a temp job to uh, the state tourism office when it was still an office rather than an authority as it is now. And I uh, worked for Muriel Anderson for a couple of years and then uh, segued to another job uh, under a gentleman named Tom Smythe, I'm sure you remember, uh, primarily to run what was the brand new state enterprise zone program, which was a paid position, but the state got, the legislature had also created simultaneously a, uh, a program to promote employee stock ownership and participation, ESOPs, ESOP was the acronym. Uh, and there's been federal tax incentives encouraging uh, businesses to share ownership and profits with their employees ever since the 1970s. That just so happened to coincide with my crystallizing doctoral dissertation topic, which in the broadest sense you might describe as uh, economic democracy. And I was going to study the past, present, and possible futures of that subject, and then apply that research and thinking to 
the state of Hawaii. And I've done that. I've been continuing to refine my thinking along those lines ever since, even long after my desire. I, want, I wanted to be a college professor. I was banking on a nationwide shortage, which was predicted back in the 80s. The shortage of professors, even in the social sciences, was supposed to happen by the mid to late 90s. Well, those experts were wrong, dead wrong. So don't, don't pay people to predict the future for you. So I ended up continuing to work at DBED. And then uh, up until the early Lingo administration, then I separated from them, eventually got a job with the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service, where I worked for about five years until I retired about five years ago. So career-wise, that's it. So how did I get into politics? Well, I continued, as I said, my reading, writing, and proselytizing about economic democracy and all that entails. And most recently, I wrote a paper uh, in April, which was going to just be a guest op-ed in response to a couple op-eds I'd read in the Star Advertiser. And before I submitted it, I circulated it to some people just for feedback. I wanted to uh, get some other opinions on it before I finalized the last the final draft. And lo and behold, a woman from the Green Party, the Hawaii Green Party still exists, been around about 30 years now. Uh, called me up and said, would you like to run for governor? And I go, <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't thought about it. I mean, I, it, uh, take my word for it. If you get master's and doctoral degrees in political science, it basically makes you even more cynical about politics <laughs> than the average person. And the average person is pretty cynical about politics, right? But uh, I, at first it sounded ridiculous, which reminded me of Jim Dater's <laughs> famous uh, dictum uh, any truly useful idea about the future should initially sound ridiculous. So I slept on it. I got up the next day, called her back, and I said, let's do it. She said, we got no money for you. We, <laughs> we don't have enough people to give you any volunteer help, but we have ballot access. So I don't know how easy, it must be pretty easy to stay on the ballot because they are on the ballot. I think you have to qualify and then you're, you're always on the ballot for 10 years or something with, before you have to requalify. But long story short, I decided to do it. And get this, I, I, I told people, to people go, why are you running for office now? You always said you, you wanted to be a professor so you could get paid to complain about politics. I said, that's true. <laughs> but the shortage of professors never happened. So, and I thought, you know, I, I, nobody will think I can win. People will think I'll get 3% of the vote. I said, but and it's not so much about how many of the votes. I thought I could do quite well, actually. I thought I could, if my plan worked out, the campaign plan I developed on my own, I thought I could get 30% of the vote, which would have shocked people. That alone would have been news. But long story short, the main reason I ran was just to get a different voice. I mean, I have lots of ideas that some are old and forgotten, some are new, some are a synthesis of old and new ideas that I've, I think I've come up with. Uh, on my own, my own original thinking based on others, others the thinking of people who have gone before me. But um, long story short, I wanted to try to change the conversation. And in the Green Party, I would have no, I would have no primary opponent. So I would have been guaranteed to be in the finals, so to speak, the political finals, the general election in November, and would have been me and whoever the Blue Party nominates and whoever the Red Party and me, although I do believe the Aloha Aina party is going to run somebody. I just don't know who it is now. Uh, but anyway, I'll finish the governor, the quest for governor first before we tilt at any other windows here. Um, so long story short, I got off to a great start. Within two weeks, I've never run for office before, never wanted to run for office before. I had no resources, no help. I spent $700 of my own money, however, on some printing some materials business cards and other stuff. But within two weeks, just based on my Facebook uh, political activism, I got invited to the Big Island by uh, two different small farm groups. Uh, one is probably more familiar to people who follow agriculture, the Hawaii Farmers Union. They were having their annual, <clears throat> excuse me, their annual conference back in May in Pahala. And I was, uh, Connect, are contacted by a, a, another group, which is probably less familiar, but it's even larger, called the Hawaii Farm, excuse me, Small Farm Hawaii, uh, 
combined, those two groups have about 12,000 members. And they asked me to come talk story, not to come over and be a politician and campaign, but just come over and talk story. I just went over in May to talk story the night before. They had a potluck the night before their four-day conference back in May. And it was going great. Uh, then I came back. And after I returned from the Big Island, I had my first Zoom meeting with the full leadership team of the Hawaii Green Party, which consists of three Wahine and five older Haole guys. Uh, long story short, I'm, I'm not going to name names, but uh, there's one gentleman on a neighbor island who is from New York City, I believe, or some big East Coast city who's lived on Maui for 30 years. He's been involved with the Hawaii Green Party for 30 years. And uh, long story short, he still is stuck in New York. I found him to be very bossy and rude. He talked down to me as, like, as if I was this child or something. And later found out he's like two years older than me when he asked me to respect my elders. So I was thinking uh, maybe when he is two, if he memorized the Encyclopedia Britannica, uh, and I was zero years of age. I might have been impressed with that. But anyway, uh, I didn't get 100% of the support of the Green Party membership. And to be honest, I don't even know still how many members they have statewide. I'd say 50 to 100 card-carrying Green Party members at most. But they have a principle. And Howard, you might have some familiarity with their background. They believe strongly in consensus. So they literally said... Any candidate that runs as a Green has to have 100% support from the entire party membership. So I had 90 or 95%, which in politics almost or in life anywhere is good enough, right? <laughs> but for them, it was not good enough. So I, uh, my quest to be the Green Party candidate for governor, but I, I believe me, what motivated me was not only just the grassroots stuff, but I don't like retail politics, but I found it, I enjoyed it more than I thought I would. I thought, so, I thought that would be the part of trying to be a politician I would like the least. You know, the actual going out and meeting and greeting and all that stuff. But it's funny when, when you feel, when you're motivated by something other than yourself or your own needs or ego or something, it changes the game a little bit. I mean, I suddenly become Mr. Mr. I don't know, uh, Mr. Happy Warrior, I guess would be the name. But, um, but I really enjoyed it. Even I remember this is an aside, and I'm, I'm getting too off track here. Please feel free to let me know. But I, at going to the just on the air, uh, the Honolulu airport on my flight to Hilo, before I got on the plane, I went. I had my business card saying I'm a Green Party candidate. I went up to a woman, just a typical looking middle aged local woman. And I just went up to her and just started a conversation with her. And she turned out that she works for the uh, uh, cable access uh, broadcasting group on Kauai. You know, all islands have their version of Olelo, which, which is what it is on Oahu. Right? And I think the show is going to be on a level among other outlets. But uh, I said, she, and I, I just talked to her for five minutes before I got on the plane. She says, you call me up and we'll get you on all, all, all four counties. We'll get you on their version of a love. <laughs> so I said, I'm not doing too bad. You know, I I'm, I'm got invited to go to this neighbor island trip to meet these two big groups. And on the way to the, 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 to the big island, I run into this woman who wants to put me on TV. So I thought, this is not bad for a, a newbie, right? For a, a greenhorn, green candidate for governor. So I'll stop and let you, I'll catch my breath and let you get ask a question and maybe point me where you want to go next. Oh, okay. So you mentioned, well, th this is a fascinating tale. And mm -hmm. I think anybody who wants to run for political office has, has a teeny little smidgen <laughs> of, of what, what it's like. It does have its ups and downs. That, that, that's for darn sure. Well, not every, I got asked, right? You know, not everybody just asks you out of the blue to run for something. So yeah, uh, yeah. maybe we need more people who want it you know, the people who have to be asked to serve and step up, uh, mm -hmm. I don't want to toot my own home, but we're the kind, we're, we're doing it for the, the rest of us, for us, not for yeah, ourselves. Yeah, right? yeah. Not, not because of political ambition. So, exactly. Solely, yeah, yeah, yeah. If I was, wanted to be a politician, I would have ran 30 years ago, Howard. You know, so mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. that ship has sailed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let us shift gears. That, that's a great, great tale. 
but you mentioned the fact that you are an idea person and you are speaking the name of this program is code green as in building energy codes yeah. and you have just one or two ideas about reforming hawaiian electric and putting us on a path to 100 percent clean energy and they were not the most conventional ideas in the world oh no no if, it's if like you can, again again uh, yeah, we, we've got about later, uh, eight or nine any, minutes so how, how many how much time do we have about we have about eight more minutes okay okay yeah yeah to quote jim data once again any truly useful idea about the future should initially sound ridiculous and i'm that's the reaction i got um uh, 20 years ago is when you might recall after Kauai had two hurricanes in 82 and 90, right? They, they were served, and I do not know the historical background of why Kauai was never under Hiko's umbrella, because Hiko is our utility, not by choice. It's just, <laughs> that's just the way it's been since before the overthrow in 1893, actually. But, um, Kauai, for some reason, was left out of HECO's coverage. And they were served at the time, in 1992, they were being, their electricity was provided by a company called Citizens Utilities, based mm -hmm. in Connecticut. And I believe the backstory in a nutshell is after two hurricanes in 10 years, I think they had overwhelming repair bills, right? Cost. And they couldn't make a go of it. They, they wanted out. So they were, what they call in business, a motivated seller. Um, and they wanted out. And the late Senator Inouye actually engineered uh, a loan from the, the Federal Rural Utilities Service for the entire purchase price. Now, I remember haggling back then about, oh, we overpaid for it and stuff. But I actually, the seller, Citizens Utilities, they, they didn't play hardball because they just wanted somebody to bail them out. And that's what we did. So that's how we got, <clears throat> excuse me, that's how we got Kauai Island Utility Cooperative, K-I-U-C, mm -hmm. yep. which unlike HECO is a locally owned, customer owned, non-profit utility. Whereas HECO is a for-profit monopoly protected by the government, guaranteed a profit margin that can fluctuate, but there's a floor and a ceiling on it. And they are com almost completely absentee owned. By that, I mean the owners of HECO are not local, except for a few mom and pop shareholders. The vast majority of HECO stock, as far as I know, still remains in the hands of huge institutional investors on Wall Street. So I, 20 years ago, that was my vision quest at that time. I thought, why can't HECO be locally owned and customer owned? and nonprofit like KIUC. And as you might know, Howard, there's up to 2,000 rural electric cooperatives, nonprofits throughout the country. Mm -hmm. uh, to the best of my recollection, they serve, they provide the electricity for roughly a third of the nation, I think. So even though they're very numerous, um, the number of customers they serve collectively is not as big as the, the industry, as we know, is still dominated by the traditional top-down, uh, uh, centralized, heavily centralized command and control utility model. And that goes into the predicted uh, utility death spiral. I think it was Stephen Chu, the federal energy secretary under mm -hmm. Barack Obama. Right? I think he popularized that term utility death spiral. I said, God, it's got to be at least 10 years ago, whenever Obama left mm -hmm. office. Um, but that was quite the buzzword. And I kind of used that to piggyback mm -hmm. onto the thinking I'd already put into how, how could we get from where we're at now, where he goes a, a, a for-profit monopoly owned by Wall Street investors primarily to something like Kauai. And I've thought about a lot of things, eminent domain and using the public trust doctrine. Uh, but it's the kind of thing it's difficult to get anybody to willingly spend a lot of time and put a lot of, a lot of hard thought into. And there's a lot of pushback to even from people we know, both know, who are very progressive and are very much want to get to 100% local energy renewable self-reliance as soon as possible. But a lot of them 
and I won't name any, I don't put anybody on the spot, but they just say, Tom, you know, by the time we've got it done, figured out how to finance it and stuff, it just would be the cost of trying to make it happen would outweigh any benefits or so that's the kind of pushback I got. And that's very plausible that they might be right. But I still, I just enjoy the mental challenge, I guess, of trying to figure out how to get it done, right? All the way up to the financing and how to, what kind of, uh, you have to, unlike Kauai, which only took one relatively small federal loan, Kiko is a whole nother animal, right? It's like the 100 pound gorillas. So buying it out and converting it to, uh, local nonprofit customer ownership would be a, a, a much bigger task. Yeah, right. we, the HECO own, or can, their clientele is 95% of the population. of. The yes, the HECO has, I said, that's why I, 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 one of these days, I think I'm going to, now we have the, the computer and the Google machine, we can find out these trivial facts much more quickly than we used to be able to, but why Kauai never was under HECO's umbrella, that'd be interesting historical tidbit to understand right but anyway i i i don't think that's i my uh, in the two minutes we have remaining my thinking no, is the ball. turns out it's more like four minutes oh okay okay that's good, good. all right well my thinking's evolved since i first started thinking about this 20 years ago how, how could we convert hico from for-profit monopoly absentee owned to non-profit customer local uh local customer ownership and and I I because I think in part because of that concept of the utility death spiral that that I think was one of the catalysts that changed my thinking. I'm thinking why should we buy out a dying behemoth like Hiko if the centralized top down 19th 20th century model of electricity generation and delivery is going to die a natural death because of Technology advances, as we know, decentralized or distributed energy and storage is becoming more and more cost effective all the time. Um, but there's a lot of pushback when you have a huge business like Eco that has hundreds of people with very comfortable jobs and lots of stake uh, sh shareholders who like the steady dividend income they get from Eco stock, all at Eco customer expense, of course, along with some help from Hawaii taxpayers. Uh, I just don't like corporate welfare. I don't like. Uh, uh, I, I'm I'm almost libertarian in that sense. I don't like taxpayers propping up businesses because you know, it's always the big businesses who are the best at manipulating the political system to max out tax taxpayer dollars. When it's the little small businesses, they don't have the resources to play that, game, so they actually pay more than they should. But, so I guess it's my natural uh, proclivities to root for underdogs that I also like to like, how can we take the big dog down, right? <laughs> and I don't mean to demonize them too much of the people that I know people who work for Eco. They're not, they're perfectly fine human beings. But I think it's a matter, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when we transition from the old school, top down, command and control, Hiko, uh, names the tune and, and plays all the music to a different model. And that segues into some things I dropped in my email to you, a uh, concept known as swarm electrification, which I understand based on what I think I know at this point is being used in areas that don't have a fully developed uh, first world electric infrastructure, right? So they, they're starting from scratch, right? They don't have the burden of this legacy uh, utility that doesn't want anything to change like we do. And we can see that in the case of KIUC on Kauai, they are far ahead of HECO in terms of the amount of renewables. They, I think they're close to like 70% of their base load comes from renewable. And HECO is still stuck at 30, 35. Or something like that. And you know what happened to rooftop solar, Howard? You know, at first they loved it, until it got to the point they claimed, oh, their circuits couldn't handle more rooftop. Uh, perhaps there's some truth to that. But the real thing is HECO only favors rooftop uh, customer, you know, self-reliance if it is in HECO's, the best interest of HECO's bottom line. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I hope no and, lightning bolts. I hope they don't send any lightning bolts my way here in the next minute. Or so. No, and you, you've got about uh, one minute left to attract lightning bolts. 
Okay. So, so what? What? You, you know, want me to trot and talk? Talk more stinking word, power. What, what would swarm? What would swarm actually look like? Well, in a nutshell, and again, I haven't read a lot about it, but I this came on my radar about a year ago. It's this idea of like they they don't have electricity, but they have all this new, incredible, increasingly more affordable decentralized generation capacity. Mm -hmm. So you know everything, and they're building up. Uh, I use the term local area network. That comes from computing, as you might have heard. And I just, somebody else might have used that, but I kind of just made my own acronym with that. Uh, electric local area networks, right? ELANs, I call them. And I, I don't know if I coined that acronym or somebody else has already used it, but I'm going to claim credit for now. <laughs> somebody tells me otherwise. But it's just an idea. It, in a place where it doesn't have, you know, a fully, fun, uh, fully uh, built out electric infrastructure, like eco, they have more flexibility and freedom to try stuff like that. And they literally build a grid from the bottom up where the generation and storage is highly decentralized, but they still connect if and when it's mutually beneficial to their neighbors, right? This uh, spoke, uh, I'm trying to, there's some nodes or something, but I, I'm sure there's people in Hawaii who thought about this too, who also favored distributed or decentralized uh, generation. Mm -hmm. But that's maybe something that. Other people have talked, talked to death, and we don't need to get into that in the last 30 seconds. So we'll get there. leave it at that. But yeah, customer right. owned, local, and my my ultimate goal, Howard, I'll leave it with this. I think it's quite feasible as well as desirable for electricity to eventually be free, completely free of cost. And in addition to 100% local renewable self-reliance, I would add to that we need our goal should be to eventually make electricity too cheap to meter, as they used to say in the old nuclear power days. Hmm. Well, believe it or not, Tom, you're not the first man to think about that or uh, come up with that idea. There was a fellow named Nicholas, Nicholas, t t t t Tesla. Tesla. <laughs> Tesla. <laughs> well, exactly. Howard, he wanted to do it wires, uh, wirelessly through the air and the ground, right? That was mm -hmm. Tesla's idea. Oh, God, what, what a concept. Whoever heard yeah. of that? <laughs> And he died penniless and insane. That's probably my in, fate too. <laughs> in, in apparently a, a cheap uh, New York hotel room. That's right. That's stuff. right. Yeah. That's, but, uh, um, there's a fine line between genius and madness. So, and but fortunately, you may be a genius, but you're you're not <laughs> mad, and you, you're not even uh, angry. But on that very cheery note, I'm not a mad I scientist. Point out that uh, here in the energy office, we see the future of electricity as being DER, distributed energy generation, where we combine the big solar farms, the wind farms, the mom and pop PV panels with a heck of a lot of storage because we make too much PV energy in the middle of the day today. Now we store it all up, we distribute it in the evening when we need it. And well, well that's what we want to do. We're not really doing that as much as we could, right? Or should. Right. Uh, there's a little, little, uh, little entity called Department of Planning and Permitting also. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> kind of like uh, <laughs> has to sign off on all this stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we're, that, that's the direction we're heading. It, it, as, as I like to say, the new power plant will be distributed energy between thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, renewable energy uh, sources. And well, bro, go ahead. Oh, no, no, you, you can have the final parting words here, Tom. I was going to say, from, from our lips to the legislature's ears, right, and to the PUC's ears, that's mm -hmm. what it takes. Our voices have to be louder than the HECO lobbyists, I think, to make this happen sooner rather mm -hmm. than later, right? Well, thank goodness we have you around, <laughs> and you can run for a higher office in the next uh, le legislative cycle and just well, blow everybody away like a great <laughs> big uh, wind machine Feeding well that, energy yeah, that's probably be, I, I, that'll be my new nickname he's the big <laughs> hot air wind machine <laughs> <laughs> well on that very very cheery note tom yeah. we do need to say bon adieu and great seeing you again and this is think tech hawaii code green tom brant uh, extraordinaire <laughs> on Monday, July 18th, 2022. See you next time. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.